Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Today, we are going to continue our discussion of deep learning, but thinking specifically about this particular type of neural network called a convolutional neural network that's been very successful in particular when thinking about doing stuff with image analysis or image prediction. So we'll talk about kind of what this idea is, why it's effective. Today, we're going to have two videos, and the first one is going to be a little bit shorter. I'm just going to do some recap of the stuff we covered last time about this, the general introduction of neural networks. And then in the second video, I'm going to introduce the kind of mathematical foundation of a convolutional neural network called a convolution. So we'll, we'll think about what that is. And then in class, we'll talk about how we apply it in a neural network setting. So let's start by recapping kind of what neural networks are. So neural networks, or also called deep learning systems, are ones that are trying to very approximately replicate how human brains work. Human brains are made of neurons that are connected to other neurons. And all of human behavior comes from neurons firing and then that signal going to their neighbors and their neighbors deciding whether or not to fire based on all the signal they're receiving. And we kind of approximate this in an artificial fashion, putting all of the neurons in layers where we have an input layer on the far left and an output layer on the far right. Input is whatever your features or inputs are, and outputs are whatever you're trying to predict. Maybe if it's just a number, just a single neuron, or if it's one of many classes, maybe many neurons. And then in the middle, we'll have a bunch of hidden neurons, hidden layers or hidden neurons, hidden layers, which kind of add structure to the learning. And every time we make a prediction, we start with all the input, the inputs become the, the values for the input neurons. Then each individual neuron does its own computation of should it fire or how much it should fire. And that's where we kind of talked about how you can learn things like Boolean functions like XOR. You can make this kind of neural network that has weights between its inputs here instead of doing a very complex task. We're really just trying to do if X1 or X2 are true, but not both, or also called XOR. And we talked about how each neuron will learn its own set of weights to help kind of work in this big orchestra of kind of making the overall prediction Y the correct possible value. And we need to learn a many, many weights in order to make that work. In this small example, we have to learn nine different weights to make this work. So we need a learning algorithm that uses kind of um, updating of these weights kind of constantly to make the outputs match what we actually want them to be. So we didn't talk too much about how that process actually works. It uses this thing called backpropagation. As a reminder, we start with a forward pass, start with the inputs that we have in our training set, make predictions on them. That's called the forward pass. Then we calculate the errors on our predictions and backpropagate those errors back to update all the weights. And again, we didn't talk about the specifics of how to do that. The three blue, one brown video we linked to does an explanation of that, but we don't care for you to know all the calculus for that. It's a little too complex for us. So we update the weights and we keep updating and updating and updating until our predictions are close to what we wanted. As a reminder, each individual neuron has two steps of its computation. First, it computes the sum of all of its inputs times the co uh, sorry times the coefficient for that um, uh, input. So I'm going to say j equals from i to d, and we'll say x of I, uh, j. Now note, it's a little bit weird to describe it as terms of the inputs x, because that's usually our feature vector that we got from our data. But this is for whatever inputs are for that one neuron. So for our later neuron, it's the inputs from, so for this blue neuron, it's the inputs from the raw data, from the input neurons. But for this neuron, it's the inputs from the previous neuron. So whatever the previous neuron said. So this is whatever the input is, the, the jth input for whatever neuron we're talking about. So we do this weighted sum. And note, um, I show in all of my slides for these kind of walkthroughs, we always add a dummy neuron to always represent the number one. So we can learn an intercept turn. You saw in the checkpoint for uh, last time that another common way this is represented is people drawing a bias 
inside the neuron saying and usually they uh whoops let me draw this out a little bit bigger they'll draw a bias inside the neuron to say subtract off this value from the weighted side these are equivalent models it's just different ways of drawing them out um so in these examples i'm always putting this dummy input but sometimes people will code these up as just having a bias in each neuron that you subtract off from the weighted sum it's a, it's equivalent once you get that weighted sum value you then pass it to your activation function And we talked about lots and lots of activation functions. So you take your sum and you feed it into your activation function G. We talked about the sigmoid. We talked about the step function, the one that goes to zero one. Um, all of them are very widely used. I'd say the sigmoid is probably one of the more most popular ones. But one of the the um, and there's lots and lots of different activation functions. But one of the ones that's kind of the most popular, at least kind of recently is this ReLU function, the rectified linear unit, that's zero before zero, and then it's kind of this linear line above. Again, this is just a way of taking the scores you compute with this weighted sum and turning it into a number between zero and one. In this case, the, the ReLU kind of caps things at zero so they're not negative, but then has this kind of increasing value for, for increasing things. So this one's actually not bounded between zero and one necessarily. Um, it's okay to have larger values here. Okay, so that's the neural network. Now, the reason we found that neural networks tend to be effective when you organize them in layers is generally each layer learns more and more complicated sets of features from the raw data, where the input layer is literally just the inputs. So if you have an image, it's gonna be all the pixels of that image. And then the first layer is kind of synthesizing those into things like gradients or edges or some kind of basic shape. And then the next layer uses those outputs, spotting this gradient, spotting this shape as its input features that then it combines into more higher level things, like things that might look like squares or things that might look like a repeated pattern. And then those, those kind of repeated patterns get synthesized into even further features that let you start recognizing things like faces or whatever you're looking for. So we tend to see that the early layers, the ones in the beginning, are learning features that are very low level very basic things about images like corners or edges and then each layer after learn successive and successive more complicated things that help us then at the final layer get something like that's close to our prediction task like detecting if a face is in an image and then we talked about one of the huge challenges with neural networks is the fact that everything is a hyperparameter in some sense the number of neurons you use, the number of hidden layers, which activation function, when you're training the thing, what's your step size or how many epochs you run it for, how, what's your batch size in the batch learning. You can go on and on and on and on. With all of the settings, you have to choose as the machine learning expert to then learn all of the right parameters, all of the weights inside the network. There are so many hyperparameters you have to choose for these neural networks. And unfortunately, unlike simple models like Lasso or Ridge, where we have a very good intuition grounded in theory of as you increase Lambda and Ridge, how that affects your overall model, we have no intuition about that for many of our neural network parameters. I can't tell you if you add another neuron or add another layer, if that will improve or hurt your model. I, we just don't have intuition for that. We treat neural networks in a lot of sense, senses like black box models. They have a lot of things you have to specify, but we don't have a really good theory or working theory about how those choices impact the, the resulting model. So a lot of time spent with neural networks is spent on hyperparameter optimization. Actually just running and training many, many models with different settings of hyperparameters. And we talked about multiple strategies. You should be very familiar with grid search, but at this point, we've done this on almost every single assignment. Try out, if you have multiple settings of hyperparameters, try every pair of them or every combination of them. If you have more than two, you want to put in combination. And what that's really doing is it's making a grid in some sense of all kind of points that kind of match up in the, the particular values you want to try. We talked about a very popular alternative to grid search is just pure random search. Just you say, I want to try epochs between one and 200. I want to try learning rate from 0.1 to 
five and just randomly sample values between there rather than specifying a discretized set of try one, two, three, four, et cetera. You just say try random numbers between here. And this generally performs better in practice because you don't spend as much time kind of on obviously bad combinations of um, of hyperparameter values. Since with grid search, if you specify one hyperparameter setting for one hyperparameter, like say this one, you have to spend kind of an equal amount of time on all kind of combinations of that one, which may or may not be good because, you, I mean, and it's hard to say because we don't know what the actual function actually looks like. But generally, random search kind of spread things out enough that you kind of usually will find a better solution. Not always, but generally. And then we talked about not one that I really care for you to know, but just to know that it exists out there or more complicated learning approaches that try to learn which hyperparameter settings you should try next based on how previous ones have done. So adaptively choosing this and one particular kind of method is called Bayesian optimization. So that is all I wanted to recap for neural network stuff that we covered la last time. In the next video, we'll talk about this idea of a convolution.